Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Understanding How to Scale RPA with Intelligent Automation. My name is David Goodstein. I'm a Member Services Coordinator for the Institute for Robotic Process Automation and Artificial Intelligence. It is our pleasure to be the co-host of today's event with COFAX and Forbes. We encourage you at any time to submit your questions to today's speakers. To do so, please click on the questions box, type your question in the space provided, and click on the submit button. Today's webinar will be recorded, and you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recorded webinar. It will also be available on our website at erpai.com. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Dan Goodstein. Dan? Thanks, David. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're uh, dialed in from. Uh, I'm Dan Goodstein. I head up the media and events business here for ERPA AI, and thanks for joining us uh, on this December webinar. We're getting to the end here, but uh, the conversations I'm having are uh, more and more excitement about what 2019 will bring. Um, and so it's a good time to have a conversation uh, like this one about probably, the, if not the top, definitely one of the top two topics our client members ask us about is how do you how do you scale this stuff and what's the next wave as it relates to uh, intelligent automation so we're, we're fortunate to have uh, not only one of the, the top players in this space the COFAX team uh, here uh, as well as uh, uh, Forbes research uh, that was been conducted um, and it's always good to have that data uh, we have a lot of conversations with members but it's always good to have uh, the data from you the marketplace as to uh, what's on your mind and, and where things are going. So uh, before I uh, introduce uh, our speakers today, just a quick uh, overview on, on ERPA AI for those of you who don't know us. Many of you uh, know us for our webinars and events, but we, we also provide a good amount of proactive assistance to those that are on the buy side trying to figure out how to do uh, all this automation uh, as well as uh, helping providers with the go-to-market strategy. Um, we have uh, international chapters that will be spinning up, uh, have been spinning up, and will continue to spin up uh, over next year. Uh, so if there's anything that we can do uh, to help you, please let my team know. We are, uh, by, by definition, a professional association and uh, kind of neutral industry resource, so uh, we're here for you. So uh, with that, let me actually, I'll ask each of uh, the speakers to introduce the, themselves, but uh, we have uh, Dan Armstrong, who's going to actually walk us through uh, uh, this research and uh, uh, from Forbes and, and Chris Huff, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at COFAX. So, Dan, let me go to you. Uh, if you could uh, introduce yourself and give a, just a little context on your background for our audience today. Oh, hi. I, I'm Dan Armstrong. I work for Forbes and I cover emerging technologies. Uh, I used to work for a big four firm in the uh, data and analytics practice. Before that, I worked at The Economist, and before that, at uh, Capital Markets Boutique in Lower Manhattan and on a foreign exchange desk. Uh, so I did the survey, I did the interviews, uh, and I authored the report that's uh, going to come out shortly. Great, looking forward to seeing that. And Chris, uh, uh, for those of you that, that don't know uh, uh, you, after uh, you've been on the speaking circuit, I think, with us for uh, the last uh, month or so, but for those that don't know you at this point. Sure, th thanks, Dan. Um, so Chris Hoff, Chief Strategy Officer at COFAX, uh, COFAX Enterprise Intelligent Automation Software Company. I uh, came over here about five months ago, much like Dan Armstrong, we've got Dan Squared this morning, but much like Dan Armstrong from Forbes came from a big four. So I led Forbes Deloitte Consulting, their US public sector RPA business for about five years. Uh, so bringing sort of some, some insights across the RPA market uh, during the very infant sort of stage uh, as we implemented and attempted to go to scale. So looking forward to today's conversation. Great, thank you both. And so we will be taking uh, questions at the end of the session. Uh, so feel free to send those out, uh, send those in throughout the, uh, the presentation. But uh, at this point, let me uh, hand it over to you, Dan Armstrong, so we can kind of start going through this, uh, this survey that you did. Hi, this is Dan Armstrong. I work for Forbes and I cover emerging technologies. Uh, before I worked for Forbes, I worked for a big four firm in the data analytics practice. And before that, at The Economist and at uh, a capital markets boutique in lower Manhattan and on a foreign exchange desk. I'm going to talk to you today about a survey on robotics process automation that Forbes did for COVAX. Now, when Forbes approached me to work on this uh, project, um, I had already heard about COFAX, and I had actually heard of COFAX 10 years before. And the reason is that I used I used to use a utility called Kapow, which was purchased by COFAX. 
Um, Kapow is a program that um, uh, reproduces um, the um, keystrokes of an individual. It can recognize characters and uh, grab data um, based on keystrokes that it records. I used it for screen scraping. Um, it, it would uh, plow through a an HTML document, uh, recognize character, recognize tags, um, grab the, the the text or the numbers between the tags, and uh, pull the data and bring it into a CSV file or a spreadsheet. Um, now, before I discovered Kapow, I had been uh, laboriously creating scrapers in Perl and then later in Python. And that was very, very tedious and laborious. Um, after discovering Kapow, it went from tedious to fast and easy. Um, now, during this project, I've talked to a lot of people at companies who are using RPA to um, perform the same kinds of actions. These are actions that would normally be done by a person at a keyboard, but doing it faster and cheaper and with fewer errors. Um, as one of my interviewees said, we use RPA to take the robot out of the human. Um, and the takeaway from my interviews, the, the big takeaway, is that people at the operating level are really excited about process automation. They're able to do, the, do their job well, um, focus on the parts they like, and be able to go home at the end of the day and see their families. Now, robotics process automation, I'm sure you already know this, but I'll just uh, I'll just define it for you. It's a form of automation that started with the idea of, of building bots, digital workers, that mimic human actions at a keyboard. In its most basic form, it's like a macro. It records keystrokes and plays them back, doing things like extracting names and numbers and text from databases, pasting them into documents or into other files, and then routing the documents to the right places. In its more advanced form, it becomes what's called intelligent automation. Now, what's intelligent about, about this process? Um, it can take in data from anywhere, from mobile devices, paper documents, even images, and strip out the information using the same kinds of cues that a human would. For instance, we all know what a toolbar looks like. Even though it's just a JPEG or a PNG file on the screen, um, now, when RPA becomes intelligent, it can recognize that two, toolbar too, even if it's just an image, even if it's not text, and navigate to the right menu, um, open it, um, pull out data, and then interpret that data and make decisions about it. Find out how, say it's a, say it pulls out a customer name, it can find, go to a database and find out how important that customer is. Maybe do some sentiment analysis on the text to see whether the customer is angry or, or happy classify the document, and then send a response or route it to a, a person with the appropriate priority. So we surveyed businesses and we tried to discover where they are in the journey to RPA and then to intelligent automation, where they plan to go, and what, if anything, is holding them back. Here's who we surveyed, 302 executives, they're mostly C-suite executives. Uh, they're all pretty senior. They're split roughly one third each between Europe, North America, and the rest of the world. They're from big companies, three quarters over two billion in revenues and the rest over a billion. And they're from a broad range of industries, a quarter are in manufacturing, the rest are in services, mostly financial services, but also retail and transportation. And here's what they told us. Now, we asked them four kinds of questions. We said, how happy are they with their processes? Um, how satisfied are they with their progress in automating the processes? What problems they face? And if they haven't scaled up to the entire enterprise, why not? So here's the first question. How optimized are your processes to accomplish your business goals? About a third of the respondents say that all their processes are optimized. Another half says that most of their processes are optimized. 
And the rest, about 20%, say that most of the processes should be rethought or that all of them are broken. Now, that's a pretty positive picture. Four out of five people say that all or most of their processes are optimized. Now, everyone's happy, or 80% of the people are happy um, with their processes, but some are more happy and some are not quite as happy. Some are less satisfied. And those people who are less satisfied, they tend to be CFOs or people in the finance function. These are people who live and die by process. They oversee some very complex processes consolidating, reporting huge quantities of detailed records to the most important stakeholders. It's high stakes, high pressure, and they are acutely aware of process flaws. If you've ever suffered through a financial close, you know what I'm talking about. Or if you've ever done hours of manual input into spreadsheets. Um, now the CFO who can find a way to do that and quickly, cheaply and accurately has tremendous amount of credibility in their organization. We used to call the financial close the dial tone of finance. It's something you've got to master the dial tone before you can do anything else, before you can do any of the fun things in your job. And that's one reason why RPA often starts in the finance function and then spreads outward from finance to other departments. Now, what does it mean when people say that their processes are optimized? We asked them, and here's what they said. It means that their processes are well-defined and well-documented, that they follow a detailed series of steps, not some kind of conceptual happy path, not some aspirational or idealized process. It's very concrete. We do A, we do B, we do C, we pass it on to this person. Um, and it's just very clear. And an optimized process is also one where the steps are performed consistently, time after time. Now, not everyone said this, but most did. Between two thirds and three fourths claimed that their processes are detailed, documented, and consistent. But here's the rub. They say their processes are optimized, but optimization is not the same as automation. And their processes are not as automated as they would like them to be. Now, here the left chart shows where the respondents think they are in terms of automation. The right chart shows where they would like to be. And the right chart is skewed to the right, which indicates that they think their processes could be a lot more automated than they are. So when executives say that they've optimized their processes, just remember one qualifier, it's optimized under constraints. Optimization is the most cost-effective or the highest performing process given existing constraints. So think about Henry Ford, think about the assembly line, 1913. It cut the, the time to assemble a car from two days to two hours. The process was optimized. It was the most optimized assembly process in the world, but it was still basically a manual process. That's why the respondents in the survey can claim that the processes are optimized, yet also say that there's lots of room for improvement. But before management realizes that there's room for improvement, they need to understand what's possible. And many are unaware of the possibilities that automation offers. Now, one of the interviewees for the paper was a guy called Max Cheprasov. His title is Chief Automation Officer, and he works for Dentsu Aegis, which acquires, it's basically a portfolio of, of companies in basically creative companies and ad tech companies. It's owned by the Japanese uh, ad, uh, ad company, uh, Dentsu. Now, Max, when he wanted to publicize RPA, or um, in his company, he made a one minute video with two panels. On the left, there was an employee doing the work. On the right, there was a robot doing the same work. By the time the robot was halfway through the process the first time, sorry, by the time the employee 
was halfway through the process the first time, the robot had done the same process 220 times. This was part of a presentation to the top finance and IT people at their portfolio of companies. The whole presentation was about an hour and a half, but that one minute video was the only thing that mattered. It told the whole story and it made a big impression. Now, the funny thing is that every person I talked to for this paper had a story with the same kind of punchline. It's a story about when, when, when managers who had previously thought that their processes were optimized saw the constraints drop away and they realized the possibilities in automation. So when 80% say that all or most of their processes are optimized, just remember that's not necessarily the ideal. It can get better. There, it, there can be big improvements. And we see that here, where we asked what scope exists for more automation of processes. Those two bars over on the right side of the chart, they add up to 80% of the survey respondents who said that they could take out at least 60% of the manual process work. That's a lot of scope for more automation. And in fact, the respondents may be underestimating the amount of automation that's possible. Let me go back to Max Chepersov, my interviewee at Dentsu. He said, when we started, we took as our benchmark some McKinsey Institute research that said close to 50% of today's menial work could be automated. Based on what I've seen across all of the functions and agencies in our network, we're closer to 75%. So remember when most of the respondents said that their, most of their processes were optimized? What that means is that they've already done a lot of the upfront work required for automation. They've defined the processes, they've documented it, they've standardized it. You can only automate or you should only automate processes that are ready for it. You don't want to automate a mess. And the first step is nailing that process cold. That's what optimizing the process does. Now, in the survey, we also asked executives about their experience with process automation. Here are five statements ranked on an agree-disagree scale. The left bar is disagree. The right two bars are agree and agree strongly. So they're in order from more agree to less agree. Um, 90% of the respondents agreed with the first statement and 80% with the last statement. So look at the first statement. Our leadership recognizes the importance of process automation to our future success. Nine out of 10 executives agreed with most of them agreeing strongly. I think that we can agree that without the support of senior management, automation initiatives won't exist or they'll only exist among individuals back in the shadows. They won't be scaled up they won't affect the enterprise. They'll just be in little pockets here and there. So what are the problems? What are the problems that the survey respondents saw? And this question is, to what extent can you automatically extract and use information from documents? In other words, to what extent can you use automation to process free text in emails, RFPs, and other types of documents? Text written by humans. Over a quarter of the man managers who answered this question say that every document has to go to a human. About 60% do some kind of text processing before it goes to a human. And 13% say they've managed to fully automate some kind of unstructured text interpretation. Now, based on the interviews I've done, I'm a little skeptical of that 13% figure. The most advanced system that I found was, once again, from Dentsu, um, which is working on a system that partially automates the responses to RFPs. So an RFP has a bunch of questions that a vendor has to answer, and their bot interprets the questions and then matches them to a set of pre-written responses sort of best-in-class responses. 
If there's no match, it routes those questions to the person whose resume indicates that they should be able to answer that question. Now, obviously, even in the very best case, the output needs to be reviewed by a human, but it's a huge step forward compared to manually responding to every RFP. The second problem is that there's too, still too much manual orchestration. A third of the respondents have robots that do small tasks, but humans have to string them together. It's like when you first uh, discovered macros in Excel, or if you're older, Lotus 1, 2, 3. You're the conductor, you know the shortcut keys, you know how to work fast, but it's still a pretty manual process. So that's an area where um, our respondents wanted to see some more improvement. But the companies that have undertaken the RPA journey are pretty darn positive. Look at the bars over on the far right. Those are performance indicators that have improved by more than 25%. And what I think is most interesting about this chart is the first one, the one with the biggest improvement. Happier employees. The employees who might have first wondered if robots were gonna take their jobs are now the biggest supporters. They're happy. And then the next two, efficiency and customer satisfaction. Those top three really stand out for me. Now, when you ask executives what's keeping them from scaling up RPA, here's what they say. There's no one big reason. There's no significant difference among the uh, five potential obstacles that you see here. So many of them say that adoption is cost prohibitive, but they also say that it's hard to estimate the ROI. To me, that suggests that they don't really have a good handle on exactly where their costs are. Um, they may also have an outsourcing system in place and be reluctant to tamper with something that works. And the fact that they have a system that apparently works may have something to do with the lack of buy-in from senior executives. I think the most compelling obstacle is the skill shortage. Um, you see, that's the third bar. Um, that was the highest reason. That was the top reason in North America, by the way. Um, in the paper, in the paper, uh, there um, is an example from PNN Bank, P and N Bank, which is a small Australian bank um, in Perth. And in that uh, that little case study, it shows how they were approached by consultants, RPA consultants, and they they just ignored them. They told them to go away. Instead, they got volunteers from the business side. These people had a bare minimum of technical skills. Maybe they knew a little SQL, you know, they knew Excel. They weren't IP, IT people, but they, but they learned, they learned how to, um, how to create, um, how to automate processes. They became advocates and they spread the word in, in, within the bank. So that's how they dealt with it. So here's the story so far. Here's the story that the survey uh, tells. So once upon a time, there was an assembly line, right? That was almost a hundred years ago. Um, and that was great. Uh, it wasn't automated, but it was optimized. Assembly line assembly time was cut by a fact was cut by a factor of ten, at least ten, and it, it changed the world. And then something changed. The world went digital. And people in offices started doing repetitive work on the desktop and on the web. And they became very productive. Copying and pasting text, populating databases, interpreting business rules. And then automation tools appeared. People started automating on their own, building macros, getting even more efficient. 
but it was still a piecemeal effort. The company started to take an enterprise approach, first within functions, then across functions, and finally automating entire routines. And things got better. And as we started to automate more and more, we started to scrutinize those exceptions through the lens of AI. And we wondered, maybe we could automate even more. The more we can delegate to the robots, the more we can up to our own jobs and concentrate on, on the human things, the things that humans do well. So what's the end of the story? We don't really know yet. We can create our own ending. Let me just quote one of my interviewees about, uh, about his ending. He said, we're discovering our way as we go, but the vision in the next three years is to, one, equip all of our employees with some sort of a digital ro assist robot, digital robot assistant, and two, give them access to a platform where they can design their own robotic solutions without IT. That's his end game. Basically empower the business. Thank you. That's that's the end. Chris? Dan, my friend, that, uh, that was a great presentation. I love the survey. The data is there. I think it speaks volumes. I did have two key takeaways. One, Lotus123, you really gave away your age when you name dropped Lotus123. <laughs> <laughs> And, and second, quote of the year, you have to master the dial tone before you can have fun. Uh, and, and I think like that, that's a good segue for this, this robotics thing. And I think you started to allude to it, Dan, is that people are having fun with this. Regardless of their, their, their functional sort of allegiance, whether it's financial management, whether it's HR, supply chain, IT, procurement, shared services, call centers, they're having fun with this because they see it as an augmentation of the workforce. Um, and so it's empowering the workforce. And, and, I, and I think there's a tremendous sort of level of global upskilling that's, that's taking place and, and we might not have a full appreciation for it, but, it, but it's happening. So what we're gonna focus in on, on the back half of this then is understanding that I think what, what Dan laid out is that there is one, the capability exists and it's real. And two, there, there are tremendous benefits if we can learn to not just harness it, but scale it. And so Chris Huff, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at COFAX, and I've been here for about five months. I came over from Deloitte Consulting, where I led the robotics and cognitive automation business for the U.S. public sector. Um, and in that capacity, I delivered an gender neutral stance. So what we're gonna discuss here, yes, it's from a COFAX perspective, but it shows an appreciation, I hope, that you'll take away from an industry perspective and what we can do together to, to help scale uh, RPA. Because if we don't, I think there's an inevitable sort of crash that's gonna happen, uh, and that's good for nobody. So you're gonna see some experience come through, again, vendor neutral stance. Um, however, it did lead me to COFAX as I started to build the next wave of robotics, which was to really address scalability challenges. Um, and we'll dig into that a little bit. But anytime you really want to sort of set yourself up for success in terms of overcoming challenges, you really need to take a step back and define the problem that you're solving for. And, and if you look at sort of the problem that we're trying to solve for around, around scalability of RPA, well, why? Um, and there's barometers throughout history, and this is just one barometer, and it is through the Industrial Revolution lens. And what we're trying to sort of distill from, from this graphic and from this story is that if you look at industrial revolutions one through three, they were really focused on workplace productivity. I mean, 1.0 was really the rudimentary power that enabled us to then sort of really harness mechanical production. So, so equipment that was brought in to the workplace to really drive productivity required people to operate machinery. 2.0 then really sort of amped it up. We then said, okay, we're gonna up the, the, the power grid, advanced power grid, now we've got electric power, but we also got really, really smart, and Dan alluded to this with the assembly line, division of labor. 
Now all of a sudden we started to group like competencies amongst people and started to manage the seam of these groups of competencies so that we could advance sort of productivity. Um, and that allowed us to mass produce. And 3.0, mere 50 years ago, is when IT automation really started to storm the workplace. I think the big game changer here was data storage. Now, all of a sudden, a person coming into the workplace, their starting point was no longer them setting down and getting started. Rather, all of the data that they had processed in the previous days now needed to be mined to determine their starting point. All of this to say that we've come to a point where we are ever connected to the workplace, and it's simply not sustainable. Most people feel as though they're trying to fit 12 hours of work into an eight-hour day, and, and it's causing a lot of work-life uh, imbalance. And so at Cofax, what we're doing is delivering these intelligent automation solutions to help scale RPA, but we're focusing on the workforce. So using all of the digital transformation and innovation of 4.0 solutions to really say we need to have not just innovative, but intuitive solutions that people can easily use to drive productivity. So we're focusing on the individual, giving them back time to, again, improve their work-life balance. But for the organization, the enterprise, delivering digital workers to provide capacity for the enterprise to determine exactly how they want to use that capacity. And what I, what I love about what Dan has done is he has essentially started to add to the volumes very quickly with established volumes of data around these 4.0 digital solutions. Five, six years ago, there was this labor arbitrage dark cloud that was following RPA around. And we couldn't get away from this cloud. It was like pig pen. It just kept following you. Um, and, and, and part of that was RPA vendors themselves. They started the business case around labor, labor arbitrage, did themselves no favors. What we found, though, is that it's not about labor arbitrage. And another well-respected and reputable global firm, World Economic Forum, did a study. This came out in October, so just a few months ago. And it basically stated that 4.0 automation solutions will definitely impact the future of work. And the way they quantified it was 75 million jobs will be displaced. The lower value transactional things that people, frankly, don't want to do, they're going to be displaced. And so those people aren't being displaced. The jobs are being displaced. The people are being upskilled. And we talked a little bit about that a couple minutes ago, and we'll get into it more as we, as we advance. But 133 million new roles, these higher value judgment-based roles, are going to be created, and that translates into 58 million net new jobs. So what we are starting to do in just the last few years is put a lot of quantitative analysis around the benefits of 4.0 solutions like RPA. That has really helped sort of with the stakeholder buy-in, especially at the executive level, um, around really harnessing this. Um, and empowering the workforce, not displacing the workforce. And again, more data. This is a global um, survey that Deloitte did with 1,600 executives that had a 4.0 solution, RPA specifically, in production at scale. And they defined scale as 50 robots in production. One robot, one license in production. And, and I just cherry picked four metrics from this, from this survey. And this was done again in October of this year. So all of this is very, very recent. But you can look in and, and across all of the metrics. And what you will find is something very similar, similar to what you see on the, the screen here is that it, it doesn't matter if you're looking for productivity, compliance, cost savings, avoidance, or increased data quality for management decision making. There's improvements across the board. So what we've essentially said at this point is that the capability is real. Those that have implemented and scaled it are seeing tremendous results. However, this is the problem that we find ourselves about as we move into 2019. Only 4% of the organization in 2018 were able to scale. And this is up from only 3% in 2017. 
This is a major problem. And if we do not address the scalability issue, we risk executives and the workforce losing faith in the RPA capability and it crashing. So the focus for 2019 for many across the industry um, is going to be on scalability and how we overcome it. And this is what we were alluding to in terms of the crash, the inevitable crash. And most know the Gartner hype cycle. Um, it's proven itself out. It, it applies time and time again to innovative solutions as they come in. And I sort of plotted on there where I believe we are in, in, in the RPA hype cycle. And I do believe we, we, it would be very difficult to inflate expectations any more than they currently are. The three sub bullets under the we are here, these were the three most prominent challenges cited by the executives in the previous survey in terms of what they needed to overcome to begin their scaling, begin scaling of their program. The first one, process fragmentation and governance. So ensuring that you have a management capability that you're not just building these RPA digital workers, but you have a sustainment model in place to manage. You don't hire an employee without a supervisor. Why would you build a digital worker without a management capability? So very, very important that you're discussing and thinking through your sustainment model day one of your pilot so it's ready to go. Lack of a clear RPA vision. Again, I think Dan alluded to the pockets or ad hoc pilots that are sort of cropping up in different parts of the business as opposed to having a unified RPA vision, so a more programmatic approach. Not to say you can't have a federated model, but to have a clear RPA vision is critical to scaling. And then lack of IT readiness. As you double click into this report, this does not allude to IT's inability or lack of proficiency. They're extremely proficient. The lack of IT readiness um, refers to the business sometimes getting ahead of IT and launching these pilots and trying to scale on their own without taking into account, one, IT engagement as the critical enabler of scalability. Because you're talking about when you have both attended and unattended, especially with the attended bots, you're going to be discussing things like IT security and policy around credentialing of these digital workers, user IDs and passwords, access to systems. All of that requires IT. And they are willing and, and ready to engage, but sometimes they're just not being engaged proactively or early enough. So I, I think that to, to avoid a hype cycle crash, there needs to be this next generation of RPA. It's not just having a sustainment model, but it's a next generation of RPA. And what I mean by that is business processes have become so complex due to globalization that we're no longer dealing with a business process that is confined within a single function or a single region. We're really talking about business processes that expand and throughout geographies but also into other functional areas to include procurement, financial management, supply chain. They just go on and on and have many stakeholders. I think regardless of the complexity of a process and regardless of the function, there is an agnostic framework that you can use to start to understand the process that you're going to attempt to apply RPA to. And this is this APAD framework, if you will, where you acquire data whether it's structured or unstructured, but you acquire data into a business process. And then once it's in machine readable format, you can hand it to RPA to begin to process the data, push it into systems for validation, but move data around. And typically what you end up doing is not just taking data and, and providing it as an output, but you analyze the data to glean insights and value of the data that's really the performance of, of various actions, calculations, pattern recognition. This typically is not RPA. And so, again, next generation RPA, and we'll get into it on the next slide, but as you go through a process, the data is being analyzed in most instances by a capability. Oftentimes, it's not RPA. And then delivering the insights of the analysis of that business process back to system of record back to a stakeholder, internal or external, but typically you need a mechanism, an automated mechanism to deliver the insights back. And so what, what I sort of see as the next generation of RPA is the blueprint for technology and innovation as it exists. And that is 
that we consolidate value pools over time. And if you think about the three sort of core value pools that you see consolidating and converging right now, it's RPA, it's business process management, and it's information capture. And a lot of the M&A activity that you see out there today sort of reinforces what's happening here. And that is that you have RPA companies and BPM companies. Um, look, at, look at Pega and OpenSpan. Um, I think that's a perfect sort of illustration of BPM acknowledging that for us to drive value, additional value for, for our customers and clients, we needed to bundle it with RPA. Same thing with Capture. Cofax is, is fortunate in that we've acquired all of these capabilities over the years through acquisitions. And so what we're able to do at Cofax, again, one of the reasons why I came here is that I am actually able to move from a services company where I can develop all of the, the best frameworks in the world, but unless you have a true product to help, um, it becomes very, very challenging. So coming to a product company that has all of these capabilities, I can begin to bundle them onto a unified platform. I think the next generation of RPA absolutely needs to extend RPA by bundling other smart automation capabilities such as BPM and information capture to really grab that unstructured data and turn it into, into structured data so that way RPA can pick it up. So at COFAX, what, what, what I'm doing at COFAX is building a unified platform for so the next generation of RPA that I'm calling intelligent automation. And it really takes the cognitive capture capability that we already have and it puts it on the platform to acknowledge that RPA, to scale RPA, you need to have data to justify the investments that you need to make in truly scaling a program. And right now, RPA, the starting point, is structured data. Most surveys will tell you that maybe 25, 30% of an enterprise's data starts in structured format. Most of it is unfortunately still in unstructured format. And so if you're just using RPA, your starting point is only 25, 30% of the available data. It's hard to stoke the, 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 the RPA with data if your starting point is only 25, 30%. And that's, a, that's a, to a large extent why some of the, the programs have difficulty justifying um, the investment that they need to get the ROI that's demanded by executives. And so adding cognitive capture allows us to go and get 100% of the enterprise's data structured and unstructured. RPA, self-explanatory, process orchestration, realizing that in an RPA-only project, when you start to scale, you're no longer just doing the simple, low-complexity business processes. You start to get into the medium and the high complexity. And when you get into those, you're typically dealing with a process that spans multiple systems. And each of those systems has an update cycle. And as those systems update, it's breaking the rule set. It's changing the rule set. Therefore, your RPA digital worker is calling in sick that day. Uh, it's not showing up because the rules changed. And so having a process orchestration adds some rigor and discipline to how you can start to manage the exceptions and the rules that are going to change because of the dynamic business environment. So I think it's critical to have a process orchestration or a BPM-like capability. And this is, again, why you saw Pega and OpenSpan sort of marrying up. Also why you see UiPath um, with a co-cell relationship with, with Abby for the cognitive capture piece of it to try to get more data for UiPath bots. But this is the industry starting to converge these value pools uh, and then advanced analytics communications to really bring a capability to automate how you take the outputs of the analysis and communicate it back via SMS, text messages, email. But being able to bulk, so batch or on-demand, uh, issue out those communications via those different channels. And then since, since RPA is really just a lever or in support of the enterprise's larger digital transformation initiative and strategy, most of that digital transformation is exactly that, moving from manual to automated, paper-based to, to web forms. Um, so the e-signature is, is, is a very strong capability that I think is being asked for in a lot more RPA projects. But this includes facial recognition, electronic signatures, again, moving away from manual and paper-based activities. So I think the next generation of RPA is not intended to compete 
with any existing software group, and that's what you see around the, the, the bubble here, is you have these various software groups, and an enterprise's digital transformation strategy may include one, all, or a combination of these. I think the next generation of RPA sets in the middle as the connective tissue to help accelerate an enterprise's digital transformation. It can really help you get those quick wins um, and it can start to move data in between these various digital solutions. An example would be, you know, a large global uh, multinational company may be setting up or, or optimizing their call center, and they may be putting chatbots on to deflect calls. Very expensive and inefficient to have people that have defined hours setting at your call center when you can start to put chatbots um, in place that are available 24-7 and can handle the repetitive questions that keep coming in. Then you've got the intelligent chatbot, say an IP soft Amelia, that can really start to get cognitive and grow over time and handle the very complex interactions. But they may be putting chatbots on while they're putting a CRM, while migrating to the cloud. And so you can really start to use RPA to do data migration in just of what's coming in through the chatbot and plugging into the CRM, and then sending over to a BI tool for analysis. So you can see how RPA is, as you sort of look at an enterprise digital transformation strategy and start to plug it in the middle as the connective tissue. And I'll, I'll end on this slide. As you, as you, we talked about sort of building the capability and then sustaining the capability. This is just a point of view around a sustainment model, and some will call this a center of excellence. I like to call it a digital management office, because I think it's more than just an RPA center of excellence. I think regardless of the initiatives that an enterprise is undertaking as part of the digital transformation, you can start to build one digital management office that would govern all of those initiatives, regardless of it's blockchain, robotics, um, chatbots. You can start to build one DMO. And you'll see from governance and strategy all the way down at the six o'clock to the day-to-day -day operational piece of this. But, and it's not to say staff this day one. It's not to say that at all. But it is to say these are the six competencies that should be taken into consideration day one of a pilot so you can start the conversations with the right people that, and you already have people in organizations that are doing a lot of this, a lot of these things. And so this is not to stand up something brand new, but it's to say, um, how are we going to not just build, but truly take advantage of RPA at scale and view it as an enterprise capability? And to do that requires a, a sustainment model. Um, and so I will, I will leave you with that. I think that's the end of the presentation. And Dan, I will turn it back over to you for Q&A. So uh, we'll take some questions now. If you have any questions for either Dan or Chris, please uh, please send them in, uh, and we'll get to as many uh, as possible. Uh, the first question I have is is for you, Dan. I'm, I'm curious as to um, you know one of the things that we have conversations a lot about is uh, did you get any data in the survey around uh, process automation in pockets within organizations, or have you or did you see any real kind of enterprise wide uh, initiatives? Um, yeah, um, I think the way RPA spreads in the companies that I talk to is that there is a pilot in a particular area, um, a particular area embraces it, um, and then once that's successful, it spreads virally. Other people begin to see the results and say, they raise their hands and say, Hey, <laughs> I've got I've got a, a something that is driving me crazy. I'm staying here till ten o'clock at night. I'm not seeing my family. I want to automate right. my process, and and then it begins to spread. It begins to spread virally within organizations. Um, there are organizations that will start and say, you know, we've never built a bot before, but now we're going to automate everything. Um, kind of a boil the ocean scenario, and that seems to be a recipe for failure. You start small, create a success, and watch it spread. And, and is there any particular, uh, in your research, was there any particular 
use cases that you found uh, particularly interesting? I mean, the one that is probably the most common that everyone knows is kind of back office financial processes, but uh, any other common use cases that, that came through in your interviews? Uh, I think the most interesting one was um, uh, at Dentsu, which was uh, uh, um, basically they, they said, yeah, the back office is fine, but if we can like automate something on the revenue side, that that's going to really get the attention of senior management. And so they developed this um, or are developing this RPA, um, uh, sorry, not RPA, this um, RFP, RFP process, um, which um, basically, I mean, answering RFPs is a very tedious task. It requires a lot of very kind of specific and it's kind of institution specific knowledge. Um, the RFP comes in with a bunch of questions and you have to know, basically you've, there, there's a lot of overlap um, among different RFPs. So basically they built a, a system that will look at a question, find answers that had been composed for similar questions previously and bring in sort of basically match answers to previous RFPs with the questions in a particular RFP. Um, and then if there was not an answer in their database, they would have a list of people that were and it could route RFP questions to people within the organization. So it basically partially automated the RFP process. Um, and then of course the human needs to come in at the end and review it and fix it up at the end. But I think that was really interesting because that really helped them, you know, it helped the sales staff, it helped them build business. So. Well, that's a good example, and, and, and that kind of dovetails into the question I wanted to ask you, Chris, which is, you know, it seems to me most of the companies that we're speaking to and, and maybe some of the ones that are indicated in the survey are, uh, are, are kind of getting soft benefits out of it. You know, they're getting some customer sat, maybe some employee satisfaction. Uh, cost reduction still seems to me to be one of the, the primary drivers. Are you seeing any companies that are, are really getting to the to the big picture improvements, market share, revenue, operating margin? How, how do you guys answer the the, the age old ROI question? And that and that is a great question. And what we typically see is that there there are two primary, very high level, but um, there are two primary sort of drivers. One is on the operational efficiency side, so cost takeout. Um, and the other one is on the revenue lift side. And Dan Armstrong got to a little bit of that. But how do you increase throughput? How do you increase the customer experience? Keep them coming back and wanting more of your product or service. Um, and so we, we see both of that. Now, the way you sort of institutionalize best practices around making sure that you're balancing both or providing what, whichever the enterprise is, is really in need of is using these RPA digital workers as capacity but there's, there's two ways to do this. One, and you guys started to talk to, is the business case. Um, and it's understanding that the business case is not one metric. And so what I always sort of advise and what we do at Cofax is that we look at the business case in a more holistic manner. So there are four pillars to every business case. Um, one is the strategic alignment. Dan Armstrong talked about pockets cropping up all over the place. And that's, and, and that's a challenge. Um, because I think the value is the sum of what RPA is doing for the enterprise, not in small pockets. And so strategic alignment is important. There was probably a digital, a large digital transformation initiative that the CEO and the C-suite is driving to and funding. It's very important, funding. And so part of your RPA business case should be how does it align to the strategic initiatives, which is, again, the larger digital transformation one. So really being able to articulate how your RPA program, or pilot if you're starting small, but think big, start small, but think big, um, how that aligns to the strategy. The second piece is the operational metrics. We talked about that and that's what everybody is very comfortable with, but compliance, increased compliance, improved customer experience, enhanced throughput, all of those are just operational metrics and that should be table stakes within your business case. The third piece is the financial impact. Um, and so this gets to, are you reshoring jobs? 
um, what's the cost of doing business? Are you driving down the total cost of ownership of a function or a division within a function? The fourth one that nobody wants to talk about, but I'm telling you, if you do not preemptively address it, it will be the thing that will come out during your, your brief out and you will not be prepared to address it. And that's workforce impact. So are you able to, using RPA, better handle attrition? Are you shifting people to higher value work? Are you upskilling people? Or are you, again, using it as a BPO? Because the, the luminaries within RPA in 2019 are predicting sort of the, not even slow death, but the quick death of BPO. BPO is a bad word right now. Bad acronym. <laughs> Three bad words. And so BPO, I do believe, is starting to die because organizations now can bring it in-house using robotics and intelligent automation, and they can do so cheaper, and they can control the quality a little better. So the BPO providers are struggling right now. So, Chris, uh, so let's stay there, right? So uh, the first so two-part question. One is, uh, do, you, do you see the impediments of RPA being more technical or organizational at this point? And assuming... You're going to say organizational. What, what's your advice to folks wearing your, your consulting hat? Uh, how do they change the work structures, the job structures, the culture? How do you create a better environment for this? Yeah, so do not do RPA in the shadows. Do not do it in the boiler room. Do this with the employees. Make them part of the solution. They want to be part of the solution. And, and the way I did this, I made it very, very real. And this was for the, the United States Treasury. Um, so they're pretty big, <laughs> the United <laughs> States Treasury. <laughs> and we did it for their shared services out of Parkersburg, West Virginia. And what we did was acknowledge very, very much upfront that there is going to be some pushback. They're unionized. There's going to be some pushback from the union and the employee base. And so what we did in a town hall was say, here's what we're doing. Um, and we were very, very transparent. But very tactically, what we did to get everybody on board to include the union in very short order was we sat down and we started with financial management within the shared services component, and they do HR and IT within the shared services and procurement. We sat down with the financial management analysts that were going to benefit, be the beneficiaries of RPA, and we sat down and we recorded them, uh, got permission, of course, but recorded them. How do you feel about robotic process automation? And you could tell they were very skeptical because, well, they feared for their jobs. And it was understandable because they didn't know. Then we recorded halfway through the pilot after they had an awareness around what RPA was and how it could benefit them. And you started to see them lean into it. You started to see them smile. They were starting to get it. And then we recorded them at the end once the RPA bots were in production and truly augmenting them and helping them get home on time. And they were leaning in fully, ear to ear smile. And now the question became, do you see a future for RPA? And they said, absolutely. It's a collaboration between us and RPA. It's doing the dull mundane work that I don't want to do. I get to come in in the morning and immediately my work is queued up for me and I get to make decisions and take action. Worker morale went through the roof. We took those three different snippets, put it into a two and a half minute video. That became the video um, that got everybody bought in, all the way from executives to analysts within functions that we then took RPA into. And so I would encourage, and that all resided within the center of excellence, which is why it's the statement model. The COE is absolutely critical. But you're right, Dan. So good guess. It is on the organizational side that you do tend to see stuff fall apart. The technology is there. It's how do you implement it, um, and that comes, I think, through the strategy within the COE. So we're seeing um, we're seeing the, the the big topic that, that I think is going to become a front and center next year, if it hasn't already, is 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 really process discovery. So I want to ask you, I want to tie that to a question we have here, Chris. Um, what what's your advice as far as uh, figuring out the right processes for RPA? Do you, is, does it make sense to start in a particular area within the organization and, and just focus there and get some success? Or do you think it makes more sense to do a more enterprise-wide, pull it all together, and then decide uh, from there where to start? So big, big question, and that's good, because that's exactly how we should be thinking. Um, and I, I believe within the center of excellence, you have training. And again, the slides that we put out there, hopefully we, we can disseminate. Um, but one of, one of those competencies within the sustainment model is training. 
training means different things. I always have um, three levels of, of training. Um, and so you've got how to find where RPA would be most applicable. You've got how to develop RPA, and then you've got how to manage an RPA. Um, and so if you think about that, the how to find is what, is what you're asking for. The how to find, I, had, I have eight attributes that I use. So you can take any candidate process, run it through these eight attributes to determine, is it fit for RPA? Great, that's the first line question. Then if it is fit for RPA, and some of them aren't, some of them need to be optimized, BPM it, you need to bring in you know, a group of Lean Six Sigma people. Um, so you need to optimize before you automate. But if it is ready for RPA, then you get to how complex is this candidate process? And I had another eight attributes that we would measure to determine, is it a simple, low, medium, or high complexity? And what that would do then is start to identify, are we going to centralize the design and development of this? Or are we going to federate our model, push it out to the lines of business, and have them do it? And so I would federate the simple and low complexity. So the businesses themselves, once they were trained on how to develop and how to manage from the centralized center of excellence, then they could do this themselves. And they were excited to do it because, again, they were upskilling their people. For the higher complexity ones, the medium and high, that typically required intelligent automation, so it was more than just RPA, that is what I, I do advise you keep a little close hold because that's when you have to string together different solutions, uh, which is what the Cofax Intelligent Automation Platform is intended to do, is to support a federated model for the centralization of highly complex automation builds, as well as the lower complexity where the business can do it themselves. Great, great. Well, we're, uh, we're about out of time, but I wanna thank our speakers today. Chris, thanks for sharing your insight, and Dan, thanks for sharing uh, yeah, your research and your survey. Um, we, uh, I believe that that uh, survey will be coming out in full detail in the next uh, few weeks, so we'll make sure to get that out to all of you. And if we if we didn't get to your question, uh, please send it in, and I'll make sure uh, someone here uh, uh, gets back to you. Um, thank you again to Cofax for supporting uh, this and the series that they're doing with us. Uh, and uh, look forward to doing more together next year. Um, keep an eye out uh, for our uh, event schedule. Um, and uh, kind of editorial calendar uh, for 2019. Uh, that will be coming out uh, shortly. Uh, in the meantime, uh, happy holidays, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone.